as it says, until 12.45, so it's going to be a bit of a short slot. And I want to make sure that you have time to ask questions as well. So, um, I'm a lawyer with Go Vegan World, and one of the things I've been doing is helping them to defend their vegan educational advertising campaign which hopefully everyone here has already heard about and somewhat familiar with. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm going to hold the microphone quite close. Is that working? Okay. Um, so what you may not be aware of though is that the campaign features the animals who were rescued from the animal using industries and who now live at Eden Farmed Animal Sanctuary. So Sandra Higgins, who runs the Go Vegan World campaign, she also runs the Eden Farmed Animal Sanctuary. And they have Go Vegan World and Eden, they are separate entities, non-profits, and they have their own social media accounts. So if you want to follow them on Facebook or look up their YouTube. And on YouTube, you will find Sandra Higgins' talks where she talks in some detail about the animals and about her campaign in more detail perhaps than I can. Um, so Sandra opened the sanctuary in 2008 and its first residents were two orphaned lambs, but they were quickly followed by 12 chickens. And the experience of living with them and learning from them is what made Sandra actually go vegan herself. And she talks very clearly about realizing that they were individuals with physical and emotional feelings, with social lives, and complex cognitive abilities, and an interest not only in not being harmed, but in staying alive and having their own lives. And one of the chickens who Sandra got to know was called Matilda, and Sandra formed a particularly close relationship with her. She went on to, unfortunately, die from the exploitation she had endured in the egg industry. And that's a very frequent occurrence and something that you learn a lot about after you go vegan and you spend time at animal sanctuaries. You realize even when we rescue hens from the egg laying industries, whatever type of farm that may be, we can't rescue them from their own bodies. They're trapped in their own bodies, which we've designed over hundreds of years to be egg laying machines. And that experience made Sandra realize that it was very important to use her time and any resources she could um, get to educate other people about the sentience of other animals and about the need for us to live vegan. There are now almost 200 animals living at Eden of various species and they really have influenced Sandra's campaign and her ads. So the educational campaign was started in 2015, initially in Ireland, but it quite quickly extended to the UK and it's also been run in Canada. And its aim is to inform people about animal sentience and about our duty to be vegan and the residents of Eden feature. And Sandra has spoken in previous talks about the importance of centering the animals in their own movement. And the ads, the important thing for me about the campaign, or the most important thing I think, is that it focuses on animal sentience and on the injustice of using living beings as if they were unfeeling things. So the campaign is not about welfare, it's not about cruelty. That there is undeniable cruelty in these industries, but that is layered on top of the fundamental injustice of using living beings for what we want from them. So obviously only, you can only really draw out one particular point with an ad. You can only say so much. And so each ad focuses on one particular aspect, something to trigger the viewer to start reconsidering what they've always been told about other animals, that they're here for us, that they're for us to use, that this is just the way things are, and to draw people's attention to what it means for other animals that we use and kill them. 
And some of the ads focus on particular things like the egg industry or the dairy industry, but it's always within this broader campaign about all animal use and about veganism being the way we recognize their rights. And in every ad, there's reference to the Go Vegan World website and the Free Vegan Guide. So the ads have been shown in a range of types of locations, from bus, buses in major cities, to toilets or bathrooms, to newspapers. And each ad will be designed depending on where it's going to be seen, how much time will the viewer have to read and contemplate what's being said. So for example, in a newspaper, you could go into a lot more detail in the text because they'll be able to sit and read that. So the ad campaign reminds people, or in some cases informs them for the first time, of the truth of what it means for animals that we use to kill them. The fact that each is an individual, sentient being, with an interest in their own lives and continuing to live. That we slaughter them, that we torture them for research, that we take away their babies for milk, that we've turned their bodies into egg-laying machines, and so on. And the, ad, the ads highlight the inherent injustice in these industries. And these are things that the animal using industries will go to lengths to push into the shadows. Unfortunately, these video ones are not going to, oh no, they are. The moving ones, I think, are particularly effective because they really bring the animals um, into the center of the campaign. So these are facts that the industry works really hard to push into the shadows and that are carefully avoided in our school curriculum. And so the last thing the industry wants is a campaign that informs people of these things and, and highlights them. So it's no surprise that there's been a negative reaction from the animal using industries to this campaign. And we've seen just in the past week or two the, the kind of reaction that the industry has to just an advert run by Tesco that mentions the fact that we eat animals. No mention of killing, no mention of accusing anybody of doing the killing, simply a little girl saying, I don't want to eat animals anymore. And the furore that that created and the, the defensive reaction from the industries has just been quite incredible, um, suggesting that farmers are being demonized when they are not mentioned in the ad. And farmers obviously grow the food that dad decides to cook instead. So, they tend to portray themselves as though all farmers use animals, and of course that's not the case. So it's no surprise that the Go Vegan World campaign gets their backs up. And that has been the case with very, very strong resistance since it was launched in Ireland. I'm sorry, let me just quickly show you this one because, no, it's not going to show. There was an ad that was shown at an international rugby match and it's really quite effective when you see it. it was the dairy takes babies from their mothers. It's really quite effective when you see that. So the reaction to the ads has been strong since it was launched in Ireland originally. And there've been many cases of the ads being refused, both by advertising agencies and by the landlords who own the advertising spaces. Um, and there's a difference between public spaces and private spaces in terms of how much we can challenge those refusals and push for them to display the ads. But we know that in a number of cases, the refusals have come from pressure being brought to bear by the industries. They obviously have a lot of money, they run a lot of advertising campaigns, and so agencies and landlords have relationships with them and they've complained about ads, including the someone not something, which they said was offensive. They've said they're too controversial. They've said they're not suitable for children. Uh, this one, they in one case said they would only run it if we took the knife away, uh, deleted the knife from the picture, which obviously 
kind of changes the whole image. So it has been a constant battle to get the ads up. But as we saw in the previous slides, nevertheless, Go Vegan World has been successful in running the ads in various locations, very widespread campaign. And again, it's no surprise that when those ads are displayed, the industry reacts and they make complaints to the advertising standards authorities, both in Ireland and in the UK. And in many cases, there, there are complaints about the ads all the time, but in many cases, or most cases, the Advertising Standards Authority can deal with them in quite short order because they're ads they've already considered because it's very easy to see that they comply with the rules. But occasionally there will be a complaint that triggers an investigation and the ASA will say, we're going to open a formal investigation and really assess this complaint. And in that case, they come to us and they ask us to justify the claims that we're making to support them with substantial evidence. And if we can't do that, then they would find that the ad was misleading. And so if an ad is found to be misleading, it can be banned effectively. So the ASA reaches a formal decision and then displays that on their website and it becomes public. And that's really the, the kind of stick in the arrangement because the negative publicity that you can get from a finding against you can be quite severe and it has an impact of whether anyone will ever run your ad again. So the ad that has caused perhaps the greatest negative reaction has been the humane milk is a myth ad. And I don't think that an ad like anything like this had ever been run before. And as a result, it caused a bit of an outcry. And because I don't think there had really been attention drawn to the fact that calves are separated from their mothers and killed. And it is quite astounding the number of adult people who are still completely unaware of that. And in the volunteer group I advocate with, we meet people like that every week. And on learning about um, what we do to cows and to calves, very often people see that they shouldn't be drinking cow's milk. So the industry really didn't like this advert and the ASA received a number of complaints from people who were open about the fact that they work in the industry. And they complained about two aspects of the ad. So one version of the ad that's run on buses just has the headline and text. The version in newspapers also has the detailed, smaller text. And that is where a first-hand experience is given of going into a dairy farm and seeing mothers still bloody from birth and seeing calves fresh from their mother's womb. And it talks about them being separated from their mothers so that we can take the milk and they don't receive it. It also talks about male calves being killed and all of them being killed at around six years old when they are not producing enough milk anymore. So all of those facts were laid out and the industry couldn't really complain in terms of the overall claim that calves are separated from their mothers because that is standard industry practice. That happens in almost every dairy farm. And in fact, in every farm they will be separated at some point. But in the vast, vast majority, they're separated pretty quickly. So because they couldn't argue that that was misleading, they had to focus on the details and they said, the use of the word still bloody from birth and fresh from their wombs, that suggests they're separated immediately. And that means you're claiming we're breaching welfare guidelines because DEFA says that they generally shouldn't be separated until they're 12 to 24 hours old. They also said that the main text, humane milk is a myth, was misleading because that was a claim that they were breaching welfare guidelines in general, that it was standard practice to breach welfare guidelines and therefore milk was inhumane. Um, and this comes back to the way farmers like to, or the way the industry likes to frame it, which is this welfare paradigm that we've all grown up with, 
and the idea that welfare regulations mean that everything is fine, that the animals are not harmed, and let's just not talk about the fact that they're killed. Um, when in fact, of course, welfare regulations are the legal rules that say just exactly how we can use and kill living beings. Just how small can we make their cage? Just how many days can we keep them indoors? And so on. So we were invited to make a detailed submission on both of those points, which we did. And again, the test is whether or not we could substantiate the claims with evidence. In terms of whether we were saying that they were breaching welfare regulations by saying humane milk is a myth, we made it very clear that far from asserting welfare breaches, the whole point of the ad was whatever kind of farm your cow's milk comes from, whatever kind of label it might carry, the exploitation that's inherent in using mammals for their milk makes it inhumane. In fact, it makes it unjust. But the inhumane word is used because the industry claims it is humane because welfare regulations exist. So the UK welfare regulations don't actually use the word humane. What they say is that we can't do anything which causes unnecessary suffering, but it allows practices, suffering and killing, that's deemed necessary to take what we want from animals. So the word humane doesn't appear anywhere in our welfare regulations. We made the point that the ad is saying, even if the regulations are followed to the letter, we are still exploiting animals, we're still using their reproductive systems, we're still taking their babies away, and we're still killing them. The whole process is wrong. That's the whole point of the ad. And any reference to welfare is a distraction from what we are saying. And then in relation to the number of hours before the calves are taken away, and this smaller text referring to still bloody from birth and fresh from the womb, that required us to get into quite a lot of industry-specific materials that we wouldn't normally get involved with because welfare is not what we're about. But we were able to produce a substantial body of evidence to show that industry itself recognises a mammal who's given birth is still bloody after 24 hours, and calves are actually still referred to as fresh at that point. And we also produced evidence of the impact on cows and calves of the separation. For example, the fact that the incidence of injuries to farmers increases markedly around calving time because the mothers are defending their babies and trying to stop them from taking them away. And we pointed out that the distress caused by separation can be even greater after 24 hours because the bond between mother and baby is stronger. So when the decision came out, the ASA decided in our favour on both matters. They said that we had provided a substantial body of evidence in support of both claims made in the ad and that viewers would understand that the ad was saying calves are removed very soon after birth and that it wasn't a commentary on compliance with welfare regulations. That decision attracted a huge amount of media coverage and it appeared in over 96 countries. And the nature of the ad and the finding, the decision, meant that the coverage had to make a real distinction between welfare breaches and the fundamental injustice of using a being to take their milk. And that's very rare. It's very rare to force the media into a position where they have to do that because they really don't want to talk about that. It also led to a number of radio interviews in which Sandra was able to go into much more detail about our general exploitation of animals, and how it's all wrong and how um, we have an obligation to be vegan, to recognize their rights. And of course, we were able to continue to run the ad because we had that finding in our favor and it's been run a number of times since then. So about a year after that, there was a complaint, or a number of complaints, um, that again were put forward to a formal investigation 
about the research ad where we, uh, Go Vegan World had said, they trust us, we torture them for research. And a medical scientist had claimed that this was misleading because scientific research, which is what they referred to, he said scientific research is regulated in the UK. So it's not right to say, to make a general statement like this, where you haven't specified you're talking about research for cosmetics or something, or household products or something like that. You've made a blanket statement, you can't do that because scientific research is regulated. So again, an attempt to rely on welfare regulations to undermine the ad. And it, again, it, the welfare paradigm is just so strong that even when faced with vegan advocates who are clearly talking about all use, you get this reaction and these defenses. The word torture can be used in different ways. Um, for example, in international criminal law, it's specifically about the infliction of pain and suffering to extract information from someone. But it can also be used to talk about gratuitous infliction of pain and suffering. So there was a risk that the ESA might say, well, we're inflicting pain and suffering, but it's for a purpose. It's for medical research, and so it's not torture. But as with the dairy ad, we pointed out that adherence or otherwise to regulations was simply not relevant. The point being made is animals are alive just like we are. What happens to them matters to them, and yet we are using them and inflicting pain on them because we can. The ad's designed to encourage people to consider if that's morally right, to use a living being who values their life and experiences pain as a research subject. And it's correct that scientific, or perhaps what he was meaning to refer to as medical research, is regulated by the Animals Scientific Procedures Act 1986, but so is all research. There isn't any distinction, and it's minimal regulation. So we had to get into some detail about animal sentience and fish sentience, definitions of torture. The ASA had asked us to tell them how many animals we were claiming were tortured every year. So we had to get into some of the statistics. But the data available is minimal and it mostly comes from figures that are published by the Home Office. And they're based in turn on the scientists' own information that they submit to the Home Office. So the scientists who work for companies who have vast financial interest in carrying out these experiments, they are asked to report on giving an assessment of the likely suffering that will be caused by the procedure that they're about to carry out, not after, before. So even using that very questionable data, we were able to demonstrate that 3.94 million experimental procedures were carried out in 2016, which was the most recent data that was available, because you're always a few years behind. 1.91 million involved creating genetically modified animals. So you don't need a severity assessment for that. Um, and genetic mutilations cover things like causing them to have a tumour. Two, over 2 million were experimental procedures, and of those, 154,000 were non-recovery, so the animals were killed by the procedure. 695,000 were deemed to be moderate or severe, causing suffering at a level we might associate with an operation or living with a disease. Severe can cover things like heart failure, internal bleeding, and collapsed lung. And moderate can cover things like implanting a device into their skull. And these assessments obviously take absolutely no account of the suffering that is related to just being in captivity in the first place, whether in isolated conditions or in very cramped conditions. The fear, depression, loneliness, the general stress of being transported and handled, or the fact that the vast majority of these animals are prey animals, and so they hide their fear and pain really, really well. 
which all affects the, the assessment by the scientists, who have a vested interest in the procedure going ahead. So we said, all of those animals are tortured. So if you want a number, it's, it's the full number. And then we said, okay, if, if you don't accept that, then we suggest that those who are genetically modified and those who are subjected to moderate or severe are tortured. So we, we gave them some options, but our principal case was they are all tortured. Again, the ESA ruled in our favour and they found that we had produced a substantial body of evidence to support the use of the word torture. And it's not clear from their decision how many animals they accepted were tortured. They kept it quite general and they just said the evidence demonstrated some animals endured pain and suffering, so the word was justified. We have more detail um, of these decisions and of our submissions on our website if anyone's interested. There's a search function on our website and if you just put into that um, ASA or torture or for the previous case, humane milk, you or yeah, you will find uh, much more detail about both of those decisions. Um, our submission was that it's wrong to torture animals for any purpose, but we did also point out the fact that research on animals is unnecessary and produces unreliable data, and there are excellent alternatives. So it seemed from looking at polls that there's quite high support in, among the public for using animals for medical research. But there's also a really high number of people saying that they feel they have inadequate information, which is no surprise because the amount of information that's available is extremely limited. So we need to educate people about the alternatives, about what we're doing to animals in these labs and about why that's wrong. And that was the purpose of the ad. We also need to get rid of the legal requirement that all medicines be tested on animals because that is holding us back from um, securing a world in which lab experiments are no longer carried out. As with the dairy ad, responding to this complaint involved really getting into the detail of what animals endure in experimentation. And as I say, because welfare is not what we do, that's something I generally don't have to expose myself to. So that was actually, it was pretty tough, but I would say I was also mindful of the fact that the people at the ASA were going to be reading this stuff. Everything that we referred them to, they would have to read in support of our submission. And hopefully that's having an effect on, on them as well. So ev everything we do is about advocacy, so you're always thinking about the advocacy angle as well. I would say that what meant, what led to our success in these two cases is because, and, and there have been a number of other cases where the ESA have upheld ads without there being a formal investigation, because you can put ads to them and have them review them and tell you, um, give you an opinion on whether or not they comply with the rules, and that's happened in a number of other cases. I would say the success in defending the ads is because they focus so squarely on animal sentience and the injustice of using and killing animals. So other ads, non-Go Vegan World ads, that have been banned by the ASA, they've tended to focus on welfareism, on specific types of use of animals and saying how cruel it is, um, and where the ASA has found that they haven't actually been able to substantiate that with evidence, and that's why the ad has, has been banned. Um, I thought I would just briefly point out that the same rules that have been used against the Go Vegan World ads can be used to complain about adverts that advocate using and killing animals for food and other purposes. So if we see adverts that, um, for animal products that we think are misleading, that we think that the advertiser will not be able to prove with evidence, we can complain to the ASA. So um, they have quite a lot of information on their website about how to make a complaint. It's pretty straightforward. And um, there's a form on the website or you can download it and do it by hand. Um, and 
this is becoming, I think, more relevant because obviously there's always been adverts about animal products and the vegan adverts are trying to counter that. They're just a tiny fraction of the adverts that we see every day, everywhere we go, promoting animal use. But nevertheless, the campaigns like Go Vegan World's campaign and the increase in people going vegan and the increase in people following plant-based diet has meant that the industry has reacted really strongly. So we're also getting reports coming through now that the meat and dairy industries of each UK country are joining forces to try to work together to be more effective in responding to what they see as vegan propaganda. Um, and just last week there was an announcement that the Irish Food Board, Board Bia, is joining forces with the meat and dairy industry in Ireland to run a major campaign, uh, which they specifically said was to counter Go Vegan World's campaign and the, the success of vegan advocacy. So we've yet to see specifically what they come out with, but I don't suspect that they'll have new ideas. It will be the same old thing where they try to claim that animal products are produced humanely, that the standards in the UK and Ireland are particularly high, that we can't possibly grow enough food to feed everyone. There, there are bound to be misrepresentations in the ads, and so it will be interesting to see if we'll be able to make complaints about any of them. If you do decide to make a complaint about an ad, I would say try to be really specific about what you're saying is misleading or inaccurate. What exactly is it that you're saying the advertiser won't be able to prove? And if at all possible, produce your own evidence that backs up your position, because that will be put to the advertiser and they'll be asked to respond to that. I think the only other thing I want to mention before taking any questions is that I have another talk at five o'clock which is about the legal rights that vegans have and how they can use them to try and improve things. And also, Go Vegan World is running a survey at the moment, which will be open for a, a short period longer, where we're asking vegans to tell us about their experiences in state institutions. And it would be really helpful if people could fill that in. And again, you can find that just by using the search tool on our website, search for a vegan survey. So with that, thanks very much for listening and I'll take any questions about what I've said or about anything.